Bungalow Bill here, and welcome back to From the Depths. Today, we're going to be taking a quick look at flamethrowers. So we're going to take a look at their sort of overall macro characteristics. We're going to take a look at how to construct a flamethrower and how to optimize one. And we're going to compare them with other weapon systems in From the Depths and see what kind of niche they cut out for themselves. Well, we talked about their macro characteristics. We'll just shoot at a few fairly easy targets to sort of see those characteristics unfold. So flamethrowers, they have a short range. They max out at around 400 meters. They do not inherit speed from the base craft. So if you're closing in on a craft that's running away from you, well, you're going to lose range, right? If you're both going at 150 meters per second, your flamethrower range is now down to 150 meters per second. So this means that you have to get in close and because it's a continuous weapon system, you have to stay in close. If the enemy, you know, if you don't just hover over an enemy that can't really viably fight back against that tactic, you are going to take shots. The exception is if you're using a small drone and the enemy is configured in such a way that they prefer other vehicles in your fleet, then you can get away with this. Really, you either have to be very tanky and comparatively large compared to your target, or you have to be a small drone and rely on the configuration of the enemy's close-in weapon systems, along with main gun targeting, to be such that you don't get hit with anything that your craft can't handle. While it sounds bad, I do that quite a lot in Neater because you can play around the Neater metagame in terms of their targeting and make that sort of drone work. Realistically, I think that's sort of where this weapon has to live. So this is just a little vehicle that I called the Flamio Hotman. Oh, we lost a jet. So I haven't heavy I haven't put heavy armor on my jets. I have considered it. But haven't actually done it yet. This craft would carry heavy armor on the jets, and we almost certainly um, got a whole punch in us there because I didn't have heavy armor on the jets. The actual craft itself has heavy armor on the belly to tank these shots. A lucky shot to the jet though will just go straight through. But that's the risk you're taking when you're punching up when you're punching up in weight and you have to have a highly maneuverable craft. It likely will have weak points and no matter how you build it, if you take a big shell in the wrong spot, your craft will get disabled. So largely you're just trying to work around that not happening. The payoff, of course, is fantastic. We're doing a lot of damage. This vehicle has 122 firepower, and that's 122 real firepower. It's not Monopoly money firepower. It's not deep water guard firepower. If you compare sort of a flamethrower to APS cram missiles that are also firing incendiary damage, the flamethrowers do the same amount of damage per second per unit of firepower. You of course have to consider, you know, hit rates and that sort of thing, but raw damage, 120 firepower worth of incendiary cram is the same as a flamethrower. Additionally, if you were to convert that cram, those missiles, those APS, to use frag or HE damage instead, the flamethrower in my, in my testing tends to do around two to three times the amount of raw damage. Of course, this damage is over time. Right, all of this damage hasn't been done yet. So you are paying a real cost in the fact that you're deferring that damage. You do get some you do get some advantages from it, like the flamethrower beam itself cannot be intercepted. If you're doing this raining down cram on the enemy, raining down bombs, shooting APS shells, lambs could intercept them, you know, anti-missile stuff can close on weapon systems, that can all intercept them. So you do get some benefit, but, and you do absolutely fantastic damage, but you are taking a lot of risk and you are paying a lot of real costs. Additionally, these weapons are very efficient. I've been using this against a lot of targets, metal targets in the water, wood targets in the air, different deep water, not different deep water guard, different, you know, great talon craft, Twin Guard craft. I've been shooting at a lot of different vehicles in the game, and I've been getting very high, very high efficiency in running costs. And the upfront costs are great as well. 
So this is 24.5k material cost, 122 firepower, that's 200 material per firepower. So a 3D cram would cost about 50% more than this. 2D cram Tetris for the same firepower would be about double. Bombs are actually the same cost and are in a smaller footprint, but you know, there are trade-offs one way or the other. We'll be looking at those later. APS around 500 for an efficient APS system. Um, lasers about a thousand material per firepower. So these do have very real benefits to using them. Now let's take a quick look at how we actually build the system before we take a look at the comparison with other weapon types. So you start with these two blocks. You, have, you either have a bottom connection or a back connection. I'm using a bottom connection here and it can shoot in this hemisphere under the vehicle. The front connection can instead, back connection can instead shoot in an, a cone in front of it. From that, you actually go and attach one of these um, pipes. I don't think you actually have to use a six way to start, but I had three units of space, so I was using a two meter and a one meter. You need a local weapon controller. You can connect to any of the blocks in the flamethrower. So here I'm actually connecting to one of the forward blocks from inside my AI compartment. And then you have tanks. You have two different sizes. You have one by one and you have three by three. And you have three different varieties. You have fuel tanks, catalyst tanks, and oxidizer tanks. I consider fuel tanks to be sort of the primary tank. These immediately convert into DPS, right? So this gun provides 22.4 fuel per second. That's effectively your damage. It's going to have to go through some sort of conversion factor dependent on the intensity and the fire resistance of the block that it's hitting but that's just proportional to how many tanks you have. So those are just raw damage. Catalyst tanks are the intensity, the armor piercing value of your fire. The formula for this is 20 times one plus the ratio between catalyst and flamer tanks. No flamer tanks, the ratio is zero, so it's 20 times one for a base intensity of 20, which is shared with other weapons, missiles, APS, crams, they all have a base intensity of 20 for fire damage. And then in this system, I have one catalyst tank for every two fuel tanks. That's a ratio of 0.5. So that's 1.5 times 20, that gives me 30 intensity. An even ratio is one. So 20 times two will give you 40 intensity. And then the last tank type is the oxidizer tank. If you put oxidizer tanks in, they'll allow your fire to strip armor faster. Something that I haven't found to be super useful, but maybe I'm underselling it. It'll also allow your fires to burn underwater. I find that if you're adding oxidizer tanks for this purpose, you should be using another damage type. The amount of efficiency that you lose is simply too high. I will have some caveats to this when we look at other weapon types, because if you take a cram and you put in maybe 5% oxidizer, it might buy enough time for the fire to spread above water so that an underwater hit does not counter all of your fuel and you get to retain that fuel above the water line instead. Because when your fire gets extinguished by fuel or you know, if your fire is cut in half, by water, I mean not by fuel. If your fire's cut in half by water, only the blocks above water remain burning, but they keep all of the fuel. You do not lose any of the fuel to the blocks underwater going out. So the final type of block is the compressor. And you can put you put the compressor on the back of the blocks. The amount of power that it consumes is proportional to the number of blocks in front of it and the power use. The the range, which is a factor, well it's a factor of your power use, it's not linear. Um, as you turn the power down, right, like 50% isn't half range, it's more than that. So, personally, I've been finding the power use moderate enough that I just crank the range all the way up. You might wanna play games with it if you really care, but for this thing, I have this little engine and it's overkill. So I haven't really found a reason to do it yet. Initially, when this was released, there were more complicated ways than just the compressor. And even the compressor itself was more complex than it is currently. You don't really have to think about it. You just put a bunch of tanks in a row, you slap a compressor on the back and you're done. Okay, so we have fuel tanks. Oh, I should also say the small fuel tanks, they're less upfront cost effective, but they're more dense. I was building this and the increased cost efficiency for the larger tanks was just so amazing, I couldn't pass it up. If you're really pushing the boundary of making small drones, you may just want to have these. 
smaller tanks. Additionally, if you're building turrets, to fill the space effectively, you are going to have to use the one by ones. You don't have to use a turret, but there are downsides to not using a turret. This thing has no drag reduction. It's, it actually causes this thing, this thing to pitch down in level flight. It's actually why it pitches up in stationary flight. I have a small corrective factor for how much it has to pitch down in forward flight so that it gets a better top speed. I could tweak it so that it only uses it in actual forward flight. Maybe I will. But it is a downside. It also, there's, there's limits to its rotation speed. So putting this thing on a turret could boost your rotation speed. It could also allow you to armor the sides, the top. You still need some of it sticking out so it can actually shoot, but you could put a little dome of heavy armor around it. That thing's pretty, pretty tanky the way that it is. But you could give it just a little survivability boost on a larger vehicle. Now, for actually building these, the only real thing is that it's only got a connection plug for pipes on one side. So these do care which way you build it. They're unidirectional. Your stacks all have to be the same type. You can't mix fuel and catalyst in a single stack. You have to have them in separate stacks. The same with oxidizers. As for the ratio, my ratio of oxidizers, I've always prefer preferred zero, but you may have your own preferences. For fuel and catalyst, it will depend on your target. I did, you, if you can call it math, I did do some of the math for this to look at how efficient, in terms of upfront cost, not running cost, the different mixes are. For running costs, it's always going to be, have the same intensity as the flame, as the fire resistance of the block that you're targeting. The running costs are just always so efficient for flamethrowers that I just don't even bother with that. I'm more concerned with upfront cost. So for upfront cost, there is a specific intensity that is most effective against different levels of fire resistance. I don't remember what it is. For metal, it's like 35, I think. But I don't remember because I was doing the calculations and it is very flat. Once you get above about 20 intensity, so half of a metal's fire resistance, the upfront cost efficiency of a flamer system is pretty level. So like 20 to 40. 20 is a little, a little suspect, but it's fine. But especially like 30 plus, you're really looking at, it doesn't matter. Your DPS per cost of the system is basically the same. So for my mind with heavy armor coming in at 60 fire resistance, I just put 30 intensity as like the baseline number. You can go above it. You can go up to 40 without really being wasteful against anything but wood and fire is fantastic against wood anyway. And burning, burning faster has its own advantages as we've seen in the flame mechanic video. So if you want to do 40, that's absolutely fine as well. Pushing above that gets expensive with no benefits against most targets other than burning faster. So I would generally suggest to stop at 40, but anywhere in the 30 to 40 range, you really can't go wrong. Oh, I did not save this craft in the right spot. Um, so anyway, the sort of last thing that you need is fuel. And you'll notice these things need a lot of fuel. They need 10.7K fuel. But Bungalow Bill, you only have 2.7k fuel and you are not running out of fuel. That is absolutely correct. Not only was I not running out of fuel, but I wouldn't have been running out of fuel if I took these boxes away and replaced them with metal so that my engine doesn't burn out. So what I'd probably do if I was going to play this vehicle in the campaign, which uh, is what I build my vehicles for, I build them for the campaign, is I'd probably go and Put a little bit of extra material storage in this vehicle. Um, let's see, yeah, I can get away with this. Put a little bit of extra material storage in this vehicle, and I would probably run it at about one third material capacity. I run almost all of my campaign vehicles at one third um, material capacity. The reason I do that is because I find a lot of utility in being able to pick up salvage, whether it's from enemy vehicles, my own vehicles, Sometimes I'll mine off of my vehicles on a resource zone 
that is not in my territory and that lets me pick it up. Sometimes I'll ferry materials with my vehicles while they're going while they're going from where I built them to where I need them, and then I'll build additional vehicles out of those material stores. So unless I really, really am incredibly space sensitive on a vehicle, I simply just run them at low material reserves and have more than I need. This does a few things. So one, in my existing vehicles, it makes these 2x2 ammunition boxes explode with one third the damage they normally would. And this is very important because most of my vehicles will have their ammunition chain react if they're run at 100% materials. So if you spawn them in the, in the designer mode, they take a shot to the materials, they're probably just going to blow up. They don't all do this, some are built to not do this, but many of them will. Similarly, these, if they're full, will have 18,000 fuel when destroyed. It's only at 20 intensity, they themselves have 40 fire resistance. These parts also have, interestingly, the compressors only have 30, the other ones have 40 actually. So maybe I shouldn't have the compressors rammed up against the fuel. That's just how this thing sort of worked out, but okay. So these things, if I'm running them at a third materials, well, now they only do 6,000 um, fire and it's at 20 intensity. They have 40 fire resistance. They're taking roughly 40%. It's a little more, it's more like 41, 42. It's like 41, 42% damage, right? So they're taking like a bit less than 3,000 damage from the fire. The fire is going to spread onto both sides and top and bottom, but even if it's just both sides, they'll be taking half. Realistically, they'll be taking a bit less than half. That means that when you're at around one third material capacity of your vehicle, your fuel storage boxes will no longer chain react, and you don't have to worry about them chain reacting. You still don't want to put them near sensitive targets, like they will absolutely burn through my engine. There needs to be a metal firewall between these and my engine so that they don't just burn straight through it. But if I run at low enough material reserves and I have metal in place, I can put these all next to each other and they will not burn each other out. Again, if you're sometimes going to be running your vehicles at higher material reserves, you need to play, plan out your flamers and its fuel reserves in a way that they don't burn each other out. The flamer fuel tanks put out a small amount of low intensity fire. So does the catalyst. This causes them to so soften each other up a little bit, but with their large health and large fire resistance pool, they are entirely non-chain reactive. It's mostly your fuel that you have to worry about, your fuel boxes that you have to worry about. But okay, back to the previous topic. Why was I not running out of fuel? Well, the reason I wasn't running out of, running out of fuel is because this tooltip about how much fuel I need is very, very wrong. So. This is a bug. There are two bugs that I'm aware of with flamers that made it into stable. They probably made it into stable because I never reported them. I'm shocked if nobody else reported them though. One of which is that, as far as I can tell, this tooltip after their latest bug fix is currently correct. Current fuel use per second is 16.8. Multiply that by 60 to get to minutes. And I'm looking at about a thousand fuel usage per second for my flamethrower. The rest of my vehicle does not take 9,000, right? This tooltip is very, very wrong. What you have to do is you have to pull this block off to remove your flamethrower usage. Look to see what the calculation for your maximum material per minute usage is. Calculate your flamethrower's usage by hand, add it in, and then give yourself enough fuel for it, right? I'm not consuming a lot of fuel for my custom material jet burn. It's about 300 per minute. My, um, the tooltip's actually here, I think. Oh, I'd have to calculate this one cylinder at a time or do math, which I don't want to do. But looks like this can drain 6.4. So, like another 360. So I'm looking at like 1.6K, a little bit more. That's tolerable off of these tanks. Certainly not 10.7K. This vehicle is actually a little bit of a miser on fuel. There's only one combustor segment in these. If you take this vehicle yourself, you can certainly throw another combustor on these, throw more fuel into the thing. You'll 
Okay, this goes 142 meters per second. You'll get more speed out of it. It's pretty slow. It's pokey compared to the demo vehicle that I had. The reason I didn't care that much is because flamethrowers themselves can't engage fast vehicles. At least vehicles over about 120 meters per second become very difficult to hit with a flamethrower because of their limited speed and the fact that they don't inherit base speed from your vehicle. So I just didn't really care about being able to engage those targets. So, all right, we've touched on the high level overview of flamethrowers and kind of how they feel. We've gone through the actual mechanics of how to build a flamethrower. Well, let's look at the, the niche that they sit in with other weapons. So here we have two equivalent weapon systems. Listening. This is a cram cannon. This is roughly the same firepower as the vehicle we're looking at. It's actually incendiary as well, not that that matters all that much. It's double the cost. It's more than double the volume. It's like 2.5 times the volume. This is a 2D Tetris. A 3D Tetris would be bigger, but would be cheaper. This is significantly heavier. It's a lot, it makes you a much bigger target. You either need more armor to have the same thickness of armor, or you just have to be more lightly armored. However, you don't necessarily have to get as close to your target. It's the same weapon speed as the flamethrower, but no real limit on the max range other than what ballistics tell you are the max limit, which is pretty long. Here we have missiles. These are also 122 firepower. They're roughly the same cost because these have no propulsion. They're nothing but warheads. These are actually bombs. So if you were to put these on a, on a dive bomber, they would be DPS equivalent to that other vehicle. Pros and cons. Inherit base speed from the construct. You put missile ejectors on these. You can get them going the same speed as flamethrowers shoot their shot at for roughly the same distance. So if you build your craft well, you can hit the same targets. You have advantages like being able to choose between multiple payloads. You don't have to use incendiary. You have other choices. You also don't have to be on target the whole time. You drop your bomb and you run away. You are vulnerable while you're approaching to drop your bomb, but you're not just hovering over the target, eating cram cannon shells or whatever. The downside is flamethrowers are not affected by any defensive systems. So missiles or other ways of delivering incendiary damage are. So these are soft targets for lambs, sea whiz, other anti-missile systems. If you drop them close enough, they're hard to hit, but lambs will still absolutely fry these and their small amounts of health, unless you put reinforced bodies on them, reducing their effectiveness. However, you can also use guided missiles. So a craft like this, well, it has to compete with other vehicles as well. For example, if I don't want to build something so heavily armored or risk getting in close range, if I just don't want to get hit, well, I can build something like this instead. This thing, actually more expensive on the material burn, although it is faster, despite being so small, actually starting to push up into the cost, way less firepower. This is if I was to make these all incendiary weapons, it would be apples to apples. It would be about a quarter of the DPS. However, this thing is launching smart missiles. It can launch them from a range. If I spawn in a deep water guard, let's do an airship. The Barracuda is not what I want. Let's do the Buccaneer. So this thing is going to be erratic. It's not going to get close. This could be more erratic than it is. However, it can't be as lightweight as the errata is and still be as fast as it needs to be. It does not have uh, enemy avoidance on it, so we might have to repair it if it rams the enemy, but it looks like it's fine. It's actually close enough that it can't have... Um, something went a little wrong there. It can't have enemy avoidance on it. I have no idea what it's doing. I've not seen this behavior before, and I've used it against aircraft a lot. Anyway, it's working eventually. It actually, it has ally avoidance though. That's what's messing it up. It can't have enemy avoidance on it, 
because if it does, it will try to avoid an enemy at this range. So I just had to take it off. But so this thing, it will have to so soak enemy fire. If the Buccaneer could actually bring a cram cannon to bear on it, it would one shot it. The Arata, on the other hand, is in absolutely no danger. It is not going to take a shot from the Buccaneer approximately ever. Short of laser systems or packs, or maybe, maybe like sandblast or railguns, it's going to be very hard to put a, put a hole in the Arata. Even getting a sufficiently accurate firing solution on it for lasers or packs is not guaranteed, although you will hit it eventually. So, all right, you're, even for small vehicles, you're making trade-offs there. And additionally, not being able to have upfront damage is a real cost. So, if these vehicles were similar size, even if I just, you know, had 122 firepower worth of crams, it's a lot of upfront damage. Uh, APHE crams could put a giant hole in the center of the Buccaneer. Listening. But let's say I'm going to make a vehicle that's roughly a similar size to the enemy vehicle. Now, I use this vehicle for comparisons a lot, or just like in general a lot, because I really like this vehicle. I think many of you like this vehicle as well. So you have to you have to compare this with melee weapons, right? One of the issues with this is that if you're limiting yourself to enemies that are 120 meters per second or slower that you can stay near, you could ram them. So, yeah, the overlap of um, targets you can flamethrower and targets you can ram is approximately one. Right, they're, they're like the same set. So, you have to start comparing melee weapons with flamethrowers. And that's where the comparison gets ugly. You are not going to out DPS the vivisector. It's actually just impossible. Um, there is not a non-melee... Every, every system in the game that can compete is a melee system, right? I don't care how much incendiary damage, how much flame firepower you put in the Vivis sector, you are not killing the Rhea faster than that. It's literally impossible. The damage, like, you just, you just put the entire Rhea on fire with 100 intensity flame at the same time, and she is not going to die as quickly as she does when you cut her in half. And this works on a lot of vehicles, and a lot of the vehicles that it doesn't work on is either because I did not put enough time into tuning this craft, because it it rams air vehicles very poorly. It can ram some, but it's mostly due to me tuning it poorly, not because it can't. I simply didn't put the hard amount of work in for a lot of the vertical adjustments that it needs. Additionally, this can engage targets that you cannot engage with a flamethrower. So, for example, Falcons. Okay, they're not terrifying for how small a vehicle this is. If this thing had a flamethrower, though, it would have a hell of a time actually hitting them. However, it doesn't. It has a laser cutter, and laser cutters can also laze things. Laser cutters are half as good as they used to be because they took out half the damage from them and really replaced it with nothing because you do not care about spreading fires with a laser cutter. But they were horrifying weapons. They're still horrifying weapons. And I think the flamethrower has to compete with this. It has to compete with this. Um, I want to hit E instead. It really has to compete with other things as well. The ram. Admittedly, you can put both the ram and the flamethrower on the same vehicle. However, I mean, the ram, if you hit a vehicle roughly the same size as you, you're doing a lot of damage with it. And once you've hit them, you might want to hit them with other things like APHE crams, um, bombs that are launched at some velocity. You might want to use some of the other melee systems that you have access to. So I always forget where you actually find these things. I think they're in here. These things, you can only deal damage with one of these at a time. These things are absolutely terrifying, though, if you get them in enemy vehicles. They don't scale well because of that. If you're doing very large vehicles, you can't like have five of these. Two vehicles can only collide at one point at a time, which limits you to dealing damage with one steam drill at a time. So let's see, on top of that, packs. Packs also have melee. They're not nearly as scary as lasers, but they are still scary. So. 
I don't know. The vivisector for this cost in laser systems could instead have 1.5 thousand incendiary firepower. I think it would make a far worse ship. I think it would make a ship that is worse in every single way. Of course, I did build this vehicle around laser cutters, but I think if you're making a similar ship and trying to outfit it with flamers, you're going to have similar issues. You're going to say, you know, I could be doing something better. So I, I really think that once you start to get to around this size, so you're a similar size to the enemy, you can now effectively you can now effectively brawl with them. You can smash into them with melee weapons. You're, you're just not going to want flamethrowers. Flamethrowers are really for these small drone vehicles, and particularly in a size point that you're not going to be using other weapons like nukes. You're not going to be using other weapons like bombs, either because you're too lazy, or for the variety of, you know, other slight concessions that they make. For whatever reason, you don't feel like making something more evasive that either never engages the target directly, fires missiles, engages the target rarely, and use packs. This is one of my favorite. I think that short-range packs doing piercing damage are a fantastic way to disable small targets. So I love to build these small orbiting vehicles that will turn towards the enemy, snipe them, pick up energy from a larger vehicle, repeat the process. And they're vulnerable for only a very short period of time when they engage and take the shot. They are far less efficient, though, than a flamethrower. And you could conceivably make a small orbiting vehicle, although it has to orbit very tightly, and that's the hard part. But you could still make a small orbiting vehicle with a flamethrower. Again, I think it's probably a second-rate option at nearly everything, but as I've shown here, you do get real good damage from them. You certainly can use them. They're not a bad option for what I think their niche is of putting them on small drone vehicles that hover near and burn down a larger target. So you may disagree with this. I might see some ships put up either on the Steam Workshop, Reddit, some other place that I take a look at, take a look at their performance and say, okay, I was wrong about flamethrowers. They're actually just the best weapon in these certain niches. But for now, that's my take on things. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed watching, and I'll see you in the future.